Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm here today to talk to you about the old Catholic movement history and theology. Uh, the reason I'm giving this talk is I've had numbers of uh, members of our parish ask me to tell them more about what old Catholicism is, and where does it come from, what does it mean, and so that's the purpose of my talk today. And so I'm going to talk about the history, the origin and development of the old Catholic movement, and some of the principal uh, theological ideas that really distinguish it and make it from other uh, churches and make it uh, different in some ways. Uh, first of all, what I'm calling here the prehistory of the old Catholic movement. This goes back to the 1500s. Uh, this is before the old Catholic movement begins. But in the Protestant Reformation in the Netherlands, uh, you had uh, the, the, church, the Catholic Church was suppressed by the state. This was something that happened throughout Europe. Uh, the prince would decide, the king would decide what the religion of the country was going to be. And so in some countries it was Protestant, in others it was Catholic. In the Netherlands it was Protestant, and so they suppressed the Roman Catholic Church. And so in 1580, the Roman Catholic Church has to go underground, essentially, uh, in the Netherlands. Now, eventually they, they start to reform within uh, the Netherlands, but there's conflict within the Netherlands among Roman Catholics there over who's going to be the bishop, uh, who are going to be the leaders of the church. And in particular, the Jesuit order was very uh, insistent on asserting the Pope's authority over the Catholic churches uh, that were there in, in the Netherlands. And this uh, produced a lot of tension between the people in the Netherlands and the Vatican in Rome. And so uh, this is, uh, there's kind of a split that's forming uh, as a result of these external events, you know, that it impressed themselves on the church in the Netherlands. Uh, so this becomes ground zero, so to speak, for the origin of the old Catholic movement is the Nether Netherlands. Now the, the, uh, the, the spark that really starts the old Catholic movement proper is the first Vatican Council in 1870. In 1870, the First Vatican Council meets, and one of the things that they uh, announce is the doctrine of papal infallibility, which means that when speaking on matters of uh, morals and doctrine, the, on behalf of the church, the Pope's word is held to be infallible. The Pope can't be wrong under certain specified circumstances. It doesn't mean everything the Pope says is right, but it does mean when he's speaking officially on behalf of the church, on matters of morals and doctrine, his word is held to be infallible. And many of the you know, uh, Catholics in uh, the Netherlands and also in other countries, Germany and Switzerland, uh, they, they would not accept this because they regarded it as something that was a new innovation that was not consistent with the history of uh, the Christian faith or the, or the church. And so they would not go along with this. And as a result, many uh, clergy and uh, academics, you know, theologians were excommunicated uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. And so they began to reform, uh, beginning in the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland, uh, the, uh, what became later the Union of Utrecht Churches of uh, the Old Catholic Movement. So now we're in 1889, and this is uh, a, a pronouncement by the Union of Utrecht Churches, uh, the Declaration of Utrecht. And these churches uh, emphasize the following things. And you can read the Union of Utrecht, I mean the Decla Declaration of Utrecht document. It's a very brief document, several paragraphs. But it sets forth some key ideas that I want to emphasize today. One is that as old Catholics, we look to the faith and practice of the first millennium, the first thousand years of the Christian faith. We look to a time uh, at, the, at the beginning of the church to try and connect with the, the core of the Christian faith. And also the, the, the bishops in the, uh, the Utrecht churches said we also are going to reject certain recent innovations, the principal one being uh, this doctrine of papal infallibility. And these, uh, these churches uh, initially, as I say, in uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland uh, formed the Union of Utrecht churches. There are others too. There are others that uh, are European churches that are all connected with uh, each other through the Union of Utrecht. They're national churches uh, in the sense that they have their own national organization. So there's the Dutch Church of the you know, Old Catholic Church, the German, the Swiss, and they're in other European countries as well. And, uh, but early on, in the early 20th century, uh, the Union of Utrecht in the Netherlands Church sent a, a mission to England. And this, now I'm telling you about uh, you know, how, how we got here. How did the old Catholic church that we're in uh, get to be here? 
So in 1908, an Englishman named Arnold Harris Matthew is consecrated a bishop uh, by the, the Dutch uh, presiding bishop Gerardus Gould. And he made him a bishop in the Old Catholic Church and sent him to England to found Old Catholic churches in England. And so he did that and he uh, ordained people to be priests and he uh, consecrated people to be bishops. One of the people he consecrated to be, to be a bishop was a man named Rudolf de Landis Burgess. This was in, in 1914, uh, Landis uh, Burgess comes to the United States. And so he begins to, uh, to try and found old Catholic churches in the United States. And uh, he ordains people priests, consecrates people bishops, and now you've got uh, old Catholic priests and bishops in the United States. And if you look at our apostolic succession, just going back a few steps, uh, not, that, not that much farther back than Bishop McCormick here, you'll find these names, De Berg, uh, Landis Burgess and Arnold Harris Matthew, because this is where our apostolic succession as old Catholics comes from, is though that uh, English mission of the, uh, the old Catholic Church that was uh, sent initially to England and then uh, to the United States. So that's basically how we got here, okay? So what is it that's distinctive about us as old Catholics? So I want to talk about a few of those things uh, in, uh, that I think are really important to us as a church to think about and to be aware of. So as I say, we look to the early church uh, for our model and our inspiration. We, if we want to understand what it means to be a Christian, we look to the, the, the first millennium, the first thousand years of the church uh, to understand what our faith means and how we define ourselves as Christians. That's one factor. Is that So we as old Catholics especially look to the early church, the way it was organized, the way they worshiped, what they believed. Those are the key things that we look at. And so old Catholicism in this sense is historically minded. It looks to history to understand how we should model ourselves as Christians. So that's one factor uh, in the way that old Catholics practice theology, the study of our faith. A second feature is independence. Independence is a key part of the old Catholic faith. And so as I, you can see from the history of it why that would be the case. Uh, they started out in you know, conflict with a much larger uh, global church and they established national churches. And these national churches today are uh, the principal organizational units of uh, the old Catholic faith. And so the national churches are, are you know, the, what we find in uh, Europe. And uh, also local churches are very important. The independence of local churches, too, is very important in the old Catholic faith. Uh, they have to be united in their doctrine and the practice and the faith. But the key thing is they are independent in the sense that each church is regarded as a whole uh, communal body, okay, which I'll talk about more in a second. All right, a third feature of how old Catholics think about our faith is ecumenism. And so what I mean is, from the very beginning, the old Catholic churches in Europe looked to other churches to try and develop bonds with them and to understand what they had in common with each other. And the ones they've had the most contact with uh, are the Anglican churches and the Eastern Orthodox churches. And it's interesting, you can see over the course of the 20th century, uh, the way in which they've interacted with the Anglican and Orthodox churches. And it hasn't just been a matter of talking to each other, but the old Catholic churches in Europe have actually adopted uh, some of the, the liturgical practices of the Anglicans. And in fact, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the movable prayers that we do are from the German old Catholic uh, church, which has been uh, the, old, the diocese of Catholics, old Catholics in Germany. And they're... Uh, they have a prayer book that they've uh, translated part of it into English, and the movable prayers that we do when we practice mass, mass are from that. And those in turn were influenced by the Book of Common Prayer, which is the Anglican uh, and Episcopal prayer book. And uh, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has been important in influencing the way old cat, modern old Catholics have thought about uh, what it means to be church, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But they, the, the, the Orthodox churches have a big emphasis on the communal nature of the church. And that's what, the, what I'm going to talk about as, as I get to the end of my discussion. So the, these have been meaningful contacts, not just talk, but actually they've influenced the practice of old Catholicism. 
All right, the third thing I want to, the next thing I want to talk about is Catholicity. What does it mean to be Catholic? And, uh, you know, people ask, are we Catholic? We, we, we have the word Catholic in our name. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we're the Roman Catholic Church. We have nothing against them, but we're a Catholic. We're just every bit as Catholic as they are, but we are a different organization. But what does our Catholicity consist in? What does it mean to us to be Catholic? Okay. Now, what this has to do, again, is I want to link back to this idea of the appeal to the early church. The early church, the church of the first millennium, when we look to that, we are looking to what was universally believed by Christians in the first thousand years of the faith. And that's what we mean by Catholic. Catholic means what was universally believed. So one uh, old Catholic theologian I've been reading calls this qualitative Catholicism or, or qualitative Catholicity. What he means is the substance of what we believe is what was believed by Christians for the first thousand years of the Christian faith. That's what we go to. So things that were developed later, uh, that's not really the core of what we do. That's not what's Catholic. Uh, what's Catholic is what was universally believed and practiced in the early church in its first thousand years. So it's a, it's a, a Catholicity of belief, a universality of belief that we look for as opposed to a universal organization. So we're not united organizationally with, uh, with other groups, but uh, insofar as we all believe the same thing, we're Catholic in that sense. We all believe the, the universal faith of the ancient church this first thousand years. All right, last thing I want to talk about is ecclesiology, and that's a fancy word for what does it mean to be church, All right? What does it mean to, to, to be part of a church and to be a church? And so uh, three ideas I want to focus on here. One is, uh, this, this goes back to especially the, the Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox thing I was talking about a minute ago, but these, I've got here two foreign words, one Latin and one Greek, but they mean the same thing. Communio is the Latin word, uh, which means fellowship. Okay? And uh, koinonia is a Greek word, which means the same thing, fellowship. And so by fellowship, what I mean is a church is a fellowship of believers in Christ. We share a common faith, and we hold fast to each other as a community, as a fellowship of people who seek union with God and with each other through Jesus Christ. Now, the, the central practice of our uh, faith is the Eucharist. So the, the Eucharist, above all, is the principal thing that we do. That's what we do every Sunday. And it's not just the practice, but it's also a concept in the sense that, that what I mean is we are a Eucharistic community. That is, we see, you know, when we take a communion, we know that Christ is spiritually present in the host and the wine. When we get together for church, Christ is spiritually present among us. So our worship together is a Eucharistic experience in its totality, right? In the host and wine that we consume, but also in our communion with each other, our communio, our fellowship with each other. We're bringing Christ into our presence when we get together to worship. Because just as uh, our Lord told us, when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. And so our worship together, our common worship, is a, is a Eucharistic uh, practice in a broad sense. All right, and then finally, uh, this goes back to this idea about independence, whether it's national churches or local per churches. But the, here's the, the, the final thing I'll mention. Each church under the leadership of a bishop is a whole unto itself. That is, even though they're part of a larger organization and there's a structure and there's leadership and so on, if you have a church, a you know, parish, under the leadership of a bishop, that is a church. It's a Eucharistic community. It has everything that's needed to be a Christian community and practice this coin communio or koinonia together. Well, we're a Eucharistic community. We have everything that we need. We love other groups and we worship with other groups and we talk to other groups and we learn to other groups and we have leaders uh, that, that are you know, elsewhere and then come to see us and so on. But we're also a, a church uh, among ourselves. And this is true for every old Catholic church throughout the world. Thank you. Do you have any questions? We can take questions for a minute before we do our camera. Yeah, questions? Anybody have any questions or thoughts or comments? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.